Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Bruce Art Watercolors. Today, we're gonna to do something a little different. Um, a Miss Anne on a Facebook page had commented and asked me how I would approach a scene where it has a lot of um, colorful flowers in the foreground. So, that's what we're gonna explore and look at today. If you ever have any questions or comments or things you'd like to see, let me know in the comments below. Um, in this case, Miss Ann shared with me a photo from another Facebook page. So she wasn't the original photographer. So I'm not painting from that. But if you have anything that you've done personally, phot uh, photograph wise, or have permission to share in that aspect, and this one I think had permission to share, but I try not to do that unless I have explicit uh, permission from the photographer. Yeah, just uh, message me and I'll see how I'd approach it and play around with it. So I have a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 11 by 14, 100% uh, cotton, and 140 pound cold press. I'm just uh, super soaking the initial layer. Um, of water and we'll get into it. So lately I've been painting very monochromatic, um, playing with two color combinations, even exploring three color combinations, triads. Uh, I haven't really done something very colorful, so I may flounder a little bit, but we'll see what comes out of it and um, see how I would explore it. So the photo she had showed me, and she showed me her results. It was a mountainous scene and the sky was very colorful and the flowers are very colorful. It was a very beautiful picture. But I immediately thought that I would have issues with a super colorful sky. Uh, two regards. Now, uh, remember everything that I say is just my own personal opinion with this. So um, also keep that in mind. For me, a colorful sky would probably create an issue versus a colorful foreground and that being said I would think the sky would have to be muted in a sense or the foreground accentuated extremely in order to create a, a depth of field so this is some raw uh, sienna that I'm just using to map out the ideas we'll have our foreground we'll create our horizon line about here We'll explore some mountains that we'll put in. Okay, let's grab a little bit of ultramarine. We can get some splashes of that going in the sky. And if you so choose, you can make it a little bit more colorful. So I would think a alizarin can be thrown in the sky. And the goal is for everything to ooh, kind of dry and muted. All right, now I'm gonna mix a little bit of this alizarin with some ultramarine for a purple. Now usually I use uh, light red oxide and the ultramarine for my distant objects. But since I already have a alizarin on the brush, I'll just start shaping out my distant mountains. I'm going to let them curve down and up as a kind of a compositional device where if I had it leading off the edge, the eye might go off the paper. So I'm just letting them curve up as just simple stopping points. And I'm thinking for uniformity, I'll bring this color down below and we'll wind up painting the flowers over it. All right, that being said, we could explore the sky more if we wanted to. We could take a paper towel, we could lift out um, some texture and some brighter areas if we want a little bit of puffy clouds. 
just play it around and have a little bit of fun with it. Okay. Now for the, the phrase is the meat and potatoes of the painting. You grab some more raw sienna. Get some burnt sienna. It'll be warmer and closer to us. Now we're going to think regards of field of flowers. So my idea is this. Um, I once read that if you were going to have the same color in the background and in the foreground, such as a yellow, which I'm putting on the brush now, lemon yellow, I want the size of the object to be smaller as it goes back. So if I use lemon yellow for background flowers like fields, and this is a thin line. The ones that are closer have to be bigger in order to create a sense of perspective. So if you do use the same color in background, midground, and foreground, keep that in mind, that right there. There's also, I think in the picture there's white flowers and um, probably like lavender. There are companies that produce lavender colored uh, pigments it's a mixture of usually a white and a blue and something else I'm not really too sure I'm gonna wash my brush I don't usually wash my brush but I'll do that here we could use maybe our light red and our ultramarine to get a strong lavender purple the light red overpowers the ultramarine very quickly. So this is on the stronger ultramarine side. And the idea once again is if I have the color in the midground or background, I'm going to create more texture and bigger devices of the same color in the foreground. Probably even put little fields that in the background. Now we're still wet and wet and I've had a lot of ideas of how we could put flowers in but so far we're just playing around wet and wet and just using the one concept that I keep on um, reiterating. Now the issue that I'm thinking is um, so much detail in the foreground, the eye's not gonna go into the background. But like I said, it's an imaginary scene, it's uh, exploring the flower field. So unless I was working to, from a photograph, we'll just mainly focus on here and a little bit of the mountains. I'm taking a card that I had cut the sharp edge of the cut I'm using to scrape and since it's wet and wet it's going to backfill and create dark lines so this starts giving us texture for stalks do tall grass this will kind of permanently damage the paper in those areas but I find that it gives um, good tonal contrast and texture you could use your rounded side if you want to pull out lighted areas, but I don't think we'd have that many lighted areas. We could use the flat side to pull out rocks, but I think we'll just stay with flowers. So that being said, let's do a dry off. Actually, one thing we could play around with is splattering, let's see if we can get some stuff to splatter out. So wet and wet splattering will give us a little bit of texture. And now we'll do our dry off. So we want to watch for how things are going to lighten up as they dry and the tonal shift that'll take place. So I'm going to pause the camera and we'll start it in a moment. Okay, so I did the dry off. We had some softening take place. We got beautiful granulation that occurred from the ultramarine. 
and it gives us good background to sit upon. I'm going to take the number one rigger, sorry, the number four rigger, holds more pigment than the number one. I'm gonna get a watered down mix of light red oxide and ultramarine. So this is gonna be my distant purple for the mountains. And I already have some semblance from when I did the wet and wet there, but let's bring out a slightly closer one. And with the mountains, you could play around with different wet and wet um, strengths and light. So dark and light back in here, a stronger mix to give ideas of shadows or ridges of trees. And we can do a lighter mix for the one behind it. One issue is if these two wind up touching while wet and wet, we'll get some bleeding between the two. If you like that effect, go for it. If you don't, you can dry off between the mountains. Do one, do a dry off, and then paint the other one. Let's grab some raw sienna, sorry, burnt sienna into this. Let's be a little closer line and start to meet our fields. A little bit of that darker mix, burnt sienna in that area. So play around, have fun, add other background mountains if you'd like. We won't put that one in completely. Just start getting the ideas of them. Okay, uh, let's grab a little lemon yellow while we're there. And once again, the whole concept is if the color appears in the background and the foreground, and if I wind up using it in both locations, uh, thinner, smaller objects, at least vertically wise. The height of this one compared to the height of this yellow, this one's larger. Now, we'll go back to the hake. We could experiment with more pure pigment. And I could stipple some flower textures in, some grass texture. I already had some ultramarine blue on there, so the lemon yellow very quickly pushes to a green for me. You know, when it comes to the flowers, you don't wanna have bop, 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 bop. You wanna have a rhythm, kinda have fun with it and create um, diversity within the texture. See if we could get stronger lemon yellow without corrupting it. Now let's go for our light red oxide ultramarine mix again, stronger. So this occurred as a watery mix originally in the background and it occurred in the foreground. Now it's coming as a strong mix for kind of a lavender, dark purple color. Get different brush strokes in there, get that rhythm. Now, let's see, I do have a special thing that I've been waiting to try. I have um, Dr. Martin's Bleed Proof White. I have never tried it yet. It does have a caution on it. I wonder why. So let me know in the comments. Maybe harmful if swallowed, so I'm not gonna swallow it. Eye irritant, contains zinc sulfate. So avoid uh, ingestion. All right, so I haven't opened this yet, but everybody 
swears by it. They say that it's like the best wipe for coverage. Um, I got this off a of Blick, but you can find it at Hobby Lobby. They had it there. In fact, Hobby Lobby had it cheaper than I'd seen it on Blick. But the packaging looked old, so I don't think anybody really ever saw it or went there to get it. So here I'm just going to dot in. I guess they'd be daisies. And I want to be sporadic and have fun with it. I'm pulling straight from the um, bottle of ink or whatever it is. I don't even know if it's ink. But I'm pulling straight from that so I don't corrupt my palette. Um, if you put gouache or anything with iridescent in it, um, it'll start contaminating everything around it. We'll also play around with the number one rigger and see if we can get, if we wanted to create the illusion of daisies and do the actual groupings of flowers, you can go in that fashion. And go in and have fun. And we'll call the bleed proof white in a moment. We'll go on to um, another textural experiment. Okay, I'm going to do a pause and a dry off. All right, so it should be dry enough. The next experiment is taking a razor blade. And if you do, be careful, please, you know. Um, and if you use the, the edge, you can pick out whites. So we have the white from the bleed proof white, but you could also dot in whites in this fashion. Play with those two side by side and see the difference in the white between them. One is damaging the paper and pulling back to the white of it. The other one is creating a white on top of it. And some people aesthetically will like the white of the paper. Others will not so, not so much. So it's up to you and what you like. If you want to scrape with that edge, it's going to skip and create skipping lines. But that might be a texture you like as well. So that is another effect you can go for. Then the last one I think we'll explore in this one, if I throw a film across the painting, I have my white gouache. So that's what we're going to try next. Now white gouache can be used in a multitude of ways by itself, or you can mix it into um, other pigments and that'll help that pigment stand out. It'll give it um, an opacity. This is Da Vinci brand gouache with, which some people say isn't the um, most opaque. And from what I've seen, I believe that's true. I think Mind of Watercolor has a um, video comparing them. But you could go in and put them in or you can mix colors into it. So I'm gonna grab this mix. I believe it was the light red oxide and ultramarine, probably some yellow in there. It's just kind of mud at this point. But if I mix my gouache into that, I don't wanna contaminate my palette. Grab some alizarin crimson. And also your wash water, if you go into it, is now going to have this. You can play with the um, direction of the number one rigger, or whichever one you use. And this one, I'm kind of pushing vertical lines down. 
being mixed with the gouache, it's going to stand out more than just if we were to make that mix. And I believe there was lavender. So lavender has that tall stalk and then it um, will push out to the sides. So we can go in and create that. We could also, if we get enough water on it, splatter this. So we splattered on the wet and wet stage. You could splatter here as well. So a lot of different ideas to play around with. I guess it's not so much painting the scene as it is uh, giving the illusion of the scene. Now, if we take a dark mix, put some birds in the sky. You could also use the dark mix for some more stalks and contrast. Now, since this was more of a demo, I feel like the picture isn't complete. I do feel like we could have something back here. And I think I'll just grab a little bit of Payne's Gray. And push that kind of a watery path, just a river in the background. And number four probably make this a quicker. I think that's a, um, not the number four. I don't know where the number four went. I think I used it a moment ago. Just creating a little watery path. That gives you a little bit of an S-shaped composition coming back to the spot. Let's do a dry off. All right, so of course you are welcome to follow along. You're welcome to sign your name to anything you do when you follow along with this channel. You have my express permission to uh, go ahead and sell anything that you do whenever you follow along with anything here. Uh, it's your painting. I want you all to be successful. I want you guys to feel confident and have money for art supplies. Art supplies are expensive. Um, on that note, if you want to support this channel, I do have various links down below. There's my number four rigger. I have the various links down below. Um, check those out. I have the Patreon. I have um, that PayPal buy me a cup of coffee thing if you'd like. If you don't, that's fine. Liking and subscribing is very helpful. I'm going to put a full picture of the image up um, right after I show you this. So I hope you all enjoyed. Have a great day. If you have any questions, comments.